Hey, bro, where do you want to keep moving here uh, just because we're on a roll for lunch? Hello, uh, my name is Spencer. I'm the director of engineering at Reaction Commerce. We're a distributed team building open source commerce technology for retailers and developers. I live in Colorado Springs, uh, but I manage and help to build a team of 15 people uh, spread across seven time zones. There's a 10 hour gap on my team alone from uh, I've backpacked one on one on Tuesday. My first one's with Maria, who's in Greece. Uh, it's her early evening. It's my morning. The next one on one I have is with Eric, who's in Los Angeles. It's his early morning. Uh, still my early morning. I'm not here to convince you that one on ones are important. We're going to start with an assumption that one on ones are a critical part of managing a team. Uh, but I'm going to try to focus our time on giving you. Uh, some tools to get the most out of your distributed team one on ones. I'm going to talk about my experience managing a distributed team, but I think the tools that I'm going to give you will apply to any team that experiences any level of remoteness, which I think at this point in this day and age is just about every team. For me, one on ones are the most important meetings of my week. One on ones are my primary interaction with people on my team each week. Uh, some weeks, the one on one is the only direct interaction I have with people on my team. Uh, because of this, my one-on-ones are the best, and sometimes the only sense that I have, or the only meeting that I have, to get a sense of how someone is really doing. Uh, additionally, there's some communication challenges that are unique to a distributed team uh, that you just don't have when you're working with a co-located team. To manage my team effectively, I use the one-on-one -on -one meeting to approximate some of the methods of communication that just aren't present or are more difficult in a distributed environment. So what are these communication challenges that I'm talking about? The first one is body language. Body language is a really important nonverbal communication method. You're going to have to work really hard to get a sense of body language when you're on a distributed team. Impromptu conversations are another one. It's really easy to take these casual conversations that happen, uh, whether it's at lunch, whether it's in the office kitchen, whether it's in the hallway, and you just run into someone, it's easy to take those for granted when you're on a co-located team. Uh, occasionally, somebody on your team may have something to tell you. When you're in a management position, somebody just wants to talk to you about something. But maybe it doesn't rise to the level of importance that they feel comfortable at interrupting you. These types of conversations are really easy to have on a co-located team. Just reach over when somebody's not busy. When you're in a distributed team, it's a lot harder to find a place for these casual conversations. Teammate interactions are a third one here. So when you're managing a distributed team, it's kind of easy. You get up, you look around, you see how people are interacting. Uh, how do you know if there's tension or if there's conflict brewing on one of your teams? Which teams are high functioning? Which ones are struggling? When you're co-located, you can get a sense of this just by observing the room. You can you can see how people interact that stand ups and other uh, rituals like rituals. When you're distributed, these interpersonal interactions are a lot harder to get a sense of. For me, when I'm managing my distributed team, the one-on-one -on -one serves as my EKG. I use the one-on-one -on -one as a health check, monitor the pulse of people, projects, and teams. Because the one-on-one -on -one serves as a proxy for a lot of these communication methods that are otherwise hidden by remoteness, it's especially important on a distributed team and in a distributed environment to have these one-on-ones to make them meaningful. Usually, you're gonna get some face time with your team in stand-ups and retros, uh, but while there may be some simil similar signals at those types of environments, they're going to be very different than what you're going to get in a one-on-one -on -one interaction. So my goal here today is to give you some practical tools that you can implement with your team on Monday. And I hope these tools will help you make one-on-one -on -one your most important meeting of the week. So let's start with some ground rules I have for my one-on-ones. These are guidelines that I use to help make sure that the one-on-one -on -one is worthwhile and effective and not just a way to burn time. So I'm not going to touch on each rule here, but I will highlight the rules that I think are especially important for a distributed team. It's important to note that these rules do run both ways. These are commitments from you to your teammates and their expectations of your team from you. So the first rule that I have here is to do it every week. You might think, wow, one-on-one -on -one every week, that seems like a lot. You're building a relationship here, though. Weekly is more effective than doing it bi-weekly or monthly, even if it's for the same total amount of time. If you take an hour and you spread it across a month, 
you might do an hour one-on-one -on -one once a month. That's going to be less effective than a 15-minute one-on-one every week. Another uh, ground rule here is to keep a shared list of notes. So I run my one-on-ones from a shared document that we have. Uh, this document serves as both the agenda and the note-taking space. During the week leading up to the one-on-one, -on -one, we'll use this as an asynchronous way to have a communication. A one-on-one -on -one direct, they can put notes in this document. I'll review the document, we can have conversations, whether it's in comments or just kind of interacting in the document. But also during the one-on-one, -on -one, I will take notes that we can both look at in real time on this document. My commitment to and my expectation from my direct is that we're only gonna have two windows open during this one-on-one. -on -one. The first one is our video. The second one is this notes. It means no multitasking. So close or minimize all of your other apps and turn off your notifications. They can wait. Another rule here is to meet in a quiet place with your camera on. So a loud coffee shop can be a really great place to get work done, especially remotely. I, I get some of my best done work done in a coffee shop. You just have all these distractions, you focus on your computer. They're actually a really poor place for a, a distributed one-on-one. -on -one. There's some visual cues that you can pick up on with the camera on that aren't present during a voice chat. So while it's not the perfect replacement for being in person, it's a lot better than a phone call. You're gonna get a sense of body language, you can practice active listening, and your direct can tell that you're engaged with them. Really important. The last ground rule that I want to highlight here is to start with a check-in. Now, we've got some ground rules out of the way. I want to move on to what do you talk about in a one-on-one, -on -one, and I want to start with a check-in. So I structure my one-on-ones into three different sections. We do the check-in, we have a discussion, and then we do our follow-ups. So as I mentioned, one of the ground rules here is to start with a check-in. Checking in effectively is, is really critical to setting the tone for a one-on-one. -on -one. So why do we check in? Uh, we check in because we need to establish stability and emotional empathy within the one-on-one. -on -one. You're going to have a very different one-on-one -on -one if somebody comes to you and they've had a family emergency or if there's something wrong in their life, they were up all night, and you don't necessarily have that sense when you're on a distributed team of you know what happened, how is it going to happen. So make sure that you check in. Uh, now, how can you check in effectively? I, I personally like to have several tools or props at my disposal. The goal is to provide an additional structure to check in on this one-on-one -on -one beyond a simple, how are you? So at the beginning of the one-on-one, -on -one, I'll often say, hey, let's start with a check-in. Now, my go-to comp for this check-in is what I call the traffic light check-in. Are you red, are you yellow, or are you green? It's really simple. This is on a spectrum from feeling down, feeling up, energetic, to dejected, you know, low energy to high energy, kind of however the person wants to go. That being said, some days you just don't fit on the spectrum. So I do have other prompts that I'll go to. Uh, fill in the blank, blank prompts like, what's the most important thing that you can finish this week? Or what's stressing me out this week is blank. can be a great way to get under the surface on these check-ins. Open-ended questions are another one that I'll use. You know, what's something that you've done recently that you're proud of? What's one interaction that's causing you stress? Do you know that this person is on a team where there's just a little bit of extra tension and maybe it's just not working out well? That's a great uh, check-in prompt. What do you need to say out loud to be fully present right now? That's another one. If you have somebody who's coming from, maybe they were just on a two-week vacation and they just came back, you're not gonna have a normal check-in. They're not gonna talk about work. You know, what's something that they need to say to be fully present? Uh, maybe Monday was an off day. Uh, there's a lot of different circumstances and conditions that should affect the way that you're checking in with your team. The second part of my one-on-one -on -one is a discussion. So after I check in, I always say the same thing. I say, where should we start today? So I like this question because it doesn't assume that the thing that they want to talk about is something that they've added to the agenda. Often the discussion is going to focus on challenges, problems, and frustrations that they're feeling, but sometimes they're not going to feel comfortable adding that to the agenda. There's times where you just don't want to write that down. I, I know I want to talk to you about this, but if I put this down in writing, you might assume something, you might read into it. So I'm not going to put that down. So I start with, where should we start today? Even if it's not what's on their list, it's really important to establish that psychological safety where they can bring anything to you. Now I use this check-in to check the pulse. Frequently the topics that are brought up in one-on-ones have something to do with the project that they're working on. 
Now, whether it's positive or it's negative, you can use these one-on-ones with each member of your team to triangulate how the project is going. If everyone on the team is checking in with a different type of problem, you can assume that there's something wrong with communication on that team. If everybody checks in with the same problem, maybe there's struggle on the team, that's normal for projects, but you can assume that the team is communicating well. Another one is to socialize and workshop ideas. So as your teammates bring you up uh, challenges, as, they, as your teammates bring you problems to have into your one-on-one, uh, you can use this as a way to socialize or workshop ideas for solving those problems. Uh, you can have a discussion about a challenge that this individual is facing uh, and see how they would approach to solve it. Try to give it back to them. Uh, another thing that you can do is if you've been thinking, if you've got an idea, because you've seen this problem come up in several one-on-ones, you can start to socialize a, an idea for solving those problems. So ask them to poke holes in the ideas that you have. And the last thing here that I would say about the discussion is to create opportunity. So when you can sense excitement within an individual for working on a particular problem, this can be a really great time to give them an opportunity to take ownership of solving that particular problem. So I'll pair engineers who have excitement for solving the same type of problem. You start to get a sense that multiple people have excitement about solving a particular problem. Pair those people up, let them take a run, or let them run with it. You don't have to be the one to solve every problem. And as you start to sense that people have passion or excitement to solve something that's wrong with the, your engineering organization, something that's wrong within a particular project, put those people together. Uh, often these, these problems or these solutions that come about uh, that I'll pair people on will have impact on the entire engineering organization, but almost always the conversations that lead those solutions start in my one-on-ones. Now, the last part of my one-on-one is to follow up. Always, always follow up. So even if the follow-up is to say you're still working on something, it's really, really important for you to follow up. Uh, if there's no follow-up, there's no accountability, there's no next steps, you're really just having a chat. You're not having a one-on-one. That's kind of useless. Um, always know the issue from previous weeks. So if somebody brings something up, you need to know what that was. Even if they don't put it on your agenda again, it's your job as a manager to know what's on that uh, issue list from, from previous weeks. For me, this is one of the reasons we use this shared agenda. I can scroll through weeks and weeks and weeks of one-on-ones and see, you know, have we talked about this? We last touched on something a month ago. Have we brought it up since? Maybe they haven't brought it up, but that doesn't mean it's not still important. I want to end with a story uh, about one of my teammates, Matt. So Matt started on my team about two years ago, software engineer, just outstanding React engineer. Uh, he comes from an e-commerce background, came from an agency. We're in the e-commerce space, we do a lot of custom work with clients, he's just a perfect fit for our engineering team. We started having one-on-ones, Matt wants to move into a product goal. My first thought was, oh no, like, I can't lose Matt, like, this would just be the, the worst thing that could possibly happen to my team would be for Matt to move out of my engineering team and into literally any other project. But, that being said, we're able to start pairing Matt or putting Matt into these product roles within the engineering team. So the first step was to have Matt take on kind of a product role. We work in pods every action. So we have cross-functional team. So Matt started taking on the product role. He was still in the engineering organization. He was still doing React software. He was still you know, very interactive in our engineering board. But he started to take on the product role and interact with stakeholders interacting with other customers. Uh, over time, over two or three different cycles, we work in six week cycles, so this is over the course of several months, we started to see that Matt was actually really, really good at product. So we added him to another product cycle. He was the, the product owner for an entire pod. Eventually, Matt moved into uh, our product council, which is like our company-wide organization that works on you know, establishing the direction that our company's going. So over time, and this was through one-on-ones, Matt, you know, like, how, how's this going? You know, can do this? I was coaching him, but we were connecting him with product leaders in the organization. We were able to put him into this product role. Uh, as of about a month ago, Matt has moved full-time into a product, technical product manager role of reaction. It crushes me that he's moved out of my engineering organization, but it's one of the great things that you have about being an engineering manager is to see people grow in their career. So Matt moving into this technical product manager role has been incredible for our company. He's started to do some really great work in our product organization. 
been incredible to see him excited about the work that he's doing. And I think it's kept him in our organization. I think if we've you know, forced him to stay within a lane that he wasn't comfortable with, he might have found a product called a different company. So we've been able to keep Matt, he's been able to stay within our organization, and he's moved into a product role. Uh, this has happened because of these intentional long ones, because of the way we check in, because of the way we follow up, because of the way that we're able to sponsor people into uh, different parts of the organization. Um, thank you, uh, I'm Spencer. Uh, if you have any questions, I know this is a 10 minute talk. I think I have no timer going, so I got a little bit of time. I'm actually going to be giving a very similar version of this talk at Lead Dev in Austin in about a month. So I wanted to keep it roughly 10 minutes, but I'm happy to answer any questions or any Q&A about distributed teams, uh, engineering management, anything like that. Anybody have some questions? Yeah? I have a question about distributed teams. How do you, how do the members of those distributed teams build communication when they are on this 10 hour? This is a great question. So I think a lot of it comes back to company culture. I think there, there can be really great distributed teams. I think there can be really, well, I would say there can be teams that are really great at communication, and there can be distributed teams that are really poor. Uh, for us, it's something that we've kind of built in at the, at, the, at the core of the company. So our entire company, minus two or three people who work from LA, is distributed. I think it's a lot easier to be remote in a company that is entirely remote than it is to be remote in a company where you're the one dialing into a conference where everybody else has a seat at the table. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is we really stress a lot of communication. So when I first started here, there wasn't a lot of pair programming. There wasn't a lot of like helping each other out over video call. We do a lot more pairing now. That's not to say that we're always a you know, one keyboard, two people type of organization. We're not pivotal, but we do highly encourage people to pair. We highly encourage people to connect on video and rubber duck things debug things. So I think that's another piece of it. Uh, and we've also, like, there's a lot of tools out there to do distributed team communication better now that just really didn't exist five years ago. Zoom, you know, while it's not perfect, is a lot better than Google Hangouts. Um, there's tools like Tuple, which is like a code pairing tool. Plus essentially, you know, two people, one keyboard, you can really interact in almost real time. It makes a lot of the lag you have when you're you're typing on somebody else's terminal. Um, Slack is okay. I think one of the things that you have to learn how to do is to teach people to shut the door. So when you're in a co-located environment, you go into your office, maybe you have an open working space, you put on your headphones, people can tell that you're working not to be interrupted. On the distributed team, you kind of have to teach people how to do that differently. And that might involve quitting Slack, might involve turning off Zoom, closing their email, and just saying, hey, for the next four hours, I'm on a network. And as a team, you kind of have to get used to people being unavailable in that way. And you either have to trust that people are working that way, or you have to have an environment where people are constantly interrupted. I don't think there's really another way to do it. That's a great question. I got a two for you. Yeah. Um, what, would you, what would you say is your distribution of text-based communication versus video and voice communication in our world? Mm, that's a great question. Um, Group-wise, I think it's probably 95% text. In one-on-one -on -one situations, it's probably closer to 60, 40. Um, so I think one of, the, one of the principles that we have around our engineering organization is we strive to be documentation-driven or documentation-first. So there's kind of layers of communication. So we say, essentially, no DMs. Like, if you're DMing somebody, it better be about something that's really private and actually not technically focused at all. Don't have any technical conversations in DMs. A layer up from that would be like an ephemeral chat channel. So Slack, maybe your engineering, hashtag engineering channel. It's an okay place to have a conversation, but even with search, like, all of those messages are gone. You just kind of have to assume that nobody's ever going to see anything. Maybe they will. You can search them. It's kind of a pain. Layer up from that might be a GitHub page. You know, it's a ticket that's really specific to uh, a specific problem. As soon as that problem is closed, it's still researchable. You can still kind of see the history and the threading. Uh, so it's better than Slack, but it's not perfect if you're really trying to establish documentation. And then the layer up from that, what we say is like, I guess the ideal form of communication would be documentation. And so if you're really trying to communicate something company-wide, we push people to say, you know, document first. If it doesn't fit in the docs, but then they get up and just kind of cascade down from there. It's not perfect. People are going to default to going to DMs, and so it's something you really have to stress. Um, Zoom is great, but 
as you mentioned, like those video channels, if you don't record the Zoom, and even if you do, honestly, most people aren't going to go back and transcribe or go back and watch the recording. It's great, but that conversation is typically lost as soon as the conversation is over. So we try to encourage people to take information from there and put them into the class. And as an extension to that, do you, I mean, if you hire remote native people, it's a lot easier to integrate them. Have you had any challenges pointing to somebody from a non remote environment and trying to get them acquainted with all of that? For sure, for sure. Yeah, so I think we have some, some victory stories around that and also have some some defeat stories. I think some people work really well in a remote environment. Um, there's other people who just really need to be in an office and need to be productive. And do you assess that? I mean, is that something that you feel like you delivered in the hiring process to go, look, if you're not, you may not be erected for that exact reason. You just can't, or what we do, we can't onboard you in this environment. We can't hire you for two agnostic. I think we, we try to assess it out. So we hire for, uh, I guess, value fit. And one of those values would be like, how well can you, written communication is really important. So like actually for our, like our screening process is like, we're gonna send you a list of questions and you have to write back to us. And partly that is because that's one of the primary communication methods that we have. And so if somebody writes back and says, you know, like, uh, can I just like get on a call and talk to this? Maybe they'd be a great fit from the tech side, maybe they'd be a great fit from one of the other sides, but if they struggle to communicate in that written method, they might not be a good fit for us uh, in, in other ways. And so that's one of the ways we do it. I think we do try to like, we, we put people into groups and try to have them solve problems in groups. Um, so we do try to stress like that interpersonal communication during the hiring process. At the same time, I mean, you'll find people who you hire them, they just don't know how to work from home. Um, so we've had people like that that we can you know, essentially pair with people who are very experienced remote workers and they can teach them what I would, what I would call from remote hygiene, you know, like create a space that's separate, like don't work in your bed, even if it's super comfortable, like it's just not a great space to work remotely, uh, you might fall asleep. Um, so there are like, I think, uh, patterns and like behaviors that you can't adopt, even if you've never worked remotely before, that's not an indicator that you can't, but you have to be somebody who's able to create that space for yourself and to move in, you know, like really be self-motivated. Like if, if you need a manager to like stand over your shoulder and do work, you're not gonna work well anymore. Any other questions? Right, cool, thank you.